to growth track. We're studying the major and minor prophets. And what we're doing tonight is the talk on number six in the series. And we're going to start with the book of Micah. If you want to take this class for credit, go to the Church of the Heartland and on the website, click on Growth Track and sign up. Father, help us in this session to know your heart, to be broken with the things that break your heart. Help us be strong in the Lord. Use us, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bible to Micah, please. Micah is going to focus on two cities. He's going to prophesy against the capital of the northern kingdom of the ten tribes. And he's going to prophesy against the capital in the southern kingdom that's called Judah. Take a look with me at chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. Listen, all of you, earth and everything on it, pay close attention. The Lord God accuses you from his holy temple, and he will come down to crush underfoot every pagan altar. Mountains will melt beneath his feet like wax beside a fire. Valleys will vanish like water rushing down a ravine. This will happen because of the terrible sins Israel, the descendants of Jacob, and what they've done. And Samaria has led Israel to sin, and pagan altars at Jerusalem have made Judah to sin. Now I'm going to read the last part of verse 5 again. I didn't do that very well. It says Samaria. Remember, that's the capital of the northern kingdom. Samaria has led Israel to sin. And pagan altars at Jerusalem have made Judah to sin. Here's the point. These two capital cities were the seedbed for the sins that multiplied throughout the nation. The northern kingdom... That nation had lots of sins everywhere. But where did they all come from? They sprang up. They sprang up from the capital city. The southern kingdom had sin everywhere. But where did it come from? It sprang up from the capital city. We would say today in the United States, our capital city is the Washington, D.C., and I would say a lot of the sins and crimes in our nation against people and against God have sprung up because of what's going on in Washington. Let me tell you two things at government. And here's what the prophet is saying. You people in these capital cities, you have two things. You have politicians and you have prophets. The politicians are corrupt. The prophets are corrupt. And because of that dual corruption in the state and in the church, corruption is coming out from you like seeds and multiplying throughout the entire nation. Sin is contagious. And if wealthy people and powerful people and political people and religious people can sin and so-called get away with it, then it will be multiplied again and again and again in every town, in every state, throughout the nation. America is no different from Samaria and Jerusalem, the capital city where politicians and prophets, religious leaders reside. And what they say often sets the pace for everything else. If they are corrupt, it will become contagious. Sin is always contagious. You always become like the people you hang out with. 
I can show you your future. Just tell me who your friends are. Because you will become, whether you recognize it or not, you'll become like the company you keep. It's inescapable. And so this prophet is very angry because God is speaking through him and saying, at the capital where you should have been at the very best of your behavior, you were in fact at your very worst. And as a result of that, your sins have been multiplied and spread everywhere. Let me just make it real practical and say that the health of the state and the health of the church determines the health of the culture and the nation. If our government is fouled up, and by government I mean the laws that are passed, I mean the judges that are approved, and the school system that's run, that's what the, the state does. It works with government agencies that are interested in courts and schools, if that's corrupt, it's going to spread. And it is spreading. I'm old enough to be able to say to you that in the 1950s, when I was going to elementary school, you know what the biggest problem was that the teachers had to face? Students who would actually have the nerve to chew gum in class. And then it got worse Sometimes a student would wad up paper when he was done, throw it and miss the wastebasket. And the third great offense, when we would go to the cafeteria, some of us would get out of line. Those were the big deals in the 50s. Today, teachers fear for their life. I know teachers that have been threatened and their arms and hands have been twisted and they've, students have fought them. That would never cross my mind when I was in elementary and beyond. Today, drugs, alcohol, premarital sex, every kind of vile thing you can imagine is being thrown at and propagated in, in one way or another, in the school system. That's the government. And when the government's bad, everybody begins to be bad. But the church is bad. Not all churches. Thank God for Church of the Heartland. I really like you guys. But I'll tell you, not every church is spiritual. Not every church wants to obey the Bible. Not every church is interested in soul winning and soul building. That's our business. But there are many, many, many churches that have never even heard of soul winning and soul building discipleship. God help us. So Micah makes his complaint and he assures that the Northern Kingdom capital, the Southern Kingdom capital, is going to be judged. And that's exactly what happened in 722 BC. The northern kingdom was invaded by Assyria. Poof, they're gone. In 586 BC, the third time the Babylonians came in, poof, they're gone. God doesn't play games. When he says he's mad, he's mad. And when he says he's going to spank, he's going to spank. And sometimes his spanking is really tough. Let's go to Nahum. Nahum is a lot like Jonah, except Jonah was successful. Even though he didn't want to be, he was. But in Nahum, we have bad news for Nineveh and for all of Assyria. We have good news for Judah, we have bad news for Nineveh. This is the second time a prophet has come to Nineveh to speak to them. Let me just read you verses 12 and 13 from Nahum chapter 1. But the Lord says, Assyria, no matter how strong you are, 
you are doomed. My people Judah, I have troubled you before, but I won't do it again. I'll snap your chains and set you free from the Assyrians. The Assyrians came in and wiped off the map, the northern kingdom in 722 B.C. They were on the edge of going into Judah, the southern kingdom, and doing the same thing. God stopped them. So his promise here was fulfilled. You need to know that when Nahum prophesied, it was 125 years after Jonah prophesied. Under the preaching of Jonah, the people repented and God did not judge them. Listen carefully. When you repent of a sin, God may withhold the spanking you deserve. And God will give you grace and peace and restore you. But if sometime later you go back into sin and refuse to repent, you're in a heap of trouble because you can't rely, but I repented when I was 12 years old. Yeah, but how old are you now? Well, I'm, I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm 50, 60. What happened at 12 years of age is good, but you can't hold on to that and cling to that if you're not living it today. Because God would have been good to you then and He'll be good to you now. But you repented back then and He was good to you. And if you refuse to repent of your sins now, you're just asking for a spanking. God doesn't spank people because He likes it. God spanks people because A, they deserve it, and B, He hopes in the spanking you'll stop what you're doing and turn to Him. Amen? The uh, nation, the city of Nineveh, capital of Assyria, was defeated by the Babylonians. And what's interesting is that territory where the great, huge, fabulous city of Nineveh rested today is just pasture land. It's not a city. It's not a town. It's not a village. It's nothing. It's been wiped clean. I don't want my life to end like that. I don't want your life to end like that. Boy, let's go out like the trees in the fall. Let's go out glorious. Amen? Let's go out beautiful. Sin brings judgment. Obedience brings blessing. Ask the Lord, even as I speak, ask the Lord. Lord, if you see me beginning to take a step a little to the right or a little to the left, and I'm getting off of center. If you see me wavering, grab me. Either send somebody to me to say, hey, you know better than that. Let's pray. That's what you want to see happen when you waver left and right. Because if that doesn't happen, you may continue left and right, and before you know it, you're a little more left, and then a little more right, and you're in the ditch. And I discovered even coming up here tonight, driving 65 miles an hour, I looked over to find something, and it didn't take very long. I was headed a little off the road. It doesn't take long to fall, but it doesn't take long to get back up and go on. Amen? That's what we want. That's what God wants. Now Habakkuk. Habakkuk was perplexed. 
this prophet had two questions for God. This prophet looked at the kingdom of Judah and he said, God, I can't, I can't tolerate it. It seems like every prophet and every priest and every ruler is corrupt. I don't know about you, but I've been listening to the news and it seems like there isn't one person in Washington who isn't corrupt. Now, I know there has to be at least one, maybe two, and maybe more. I hope more, but I'll tell you, I think we could say the same thing Habakkuk said. Every place I look, I see foolishness. I see sin. I see corruption. People are, police are shooting people. People are shooting police. Politicians are blaming other politicians. They're not getting very much done. It's corrupt. And Habakkuk looked at the church in his day. He looked at the politicians in his day. And he said, God, I'm sick. And here's my question. Why haven't you come down and done something? Not a bad question. I'm sick of it. You've got to be sick of it. Why haven't you done something? Well, God answers Habakkuk. And he says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to bring in the Babylonians and I'm going to wipe the slate clean over there in Judah and there won't be anybody left, virtually anyone, and I'm going to take 40,000 back to the, as prisoners of war to Babylon and a few poor people here and you guys are going to end up going down to Egypt. When Habakkuk heard that answer, he just about fainted. He couldn't stand up. He wanted to pass out because he said, God, we are terrible. But those Babylonians are the kings of terrible. You can't use people that wretched to come in and deal with our wretchedness. And God said, yeah, I can, I will. And when it's all done, I'm going to judge them also. That satisfied Habakkuk. He needed to know, A, that God was going to do something with the foolishness in the politicians and in the preachers of his day. God was going to do something. He was going to do it in a way I never thought he would do it. But he's going to do something. And you know, he's going to do it today too. I don't know how long America will be, we'll, we'll say, the greatest nation on the planet. I say that because of all the blessings I've experienced, and you too. But you know, very few things last forever. Heaven will, the kingdom of God will, but nothing else. We don't know what's going to happen to America, but listen closely. We are overdue for judgment. God would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if he didn't judge us. Because I think we've got problems just as deep and even wider in scope than they had. We're in trouble. Habakkuk discovered God's going to take care of it. And you know what he did in chapter 3 to wrap everything up? He wrote a song. He, he began this book, I'm so angry at the people and all the sin. And then he's even more angry. God, how in the world could you bring in those people to take care of us, and then when he gets done. You know, when you finally listen to God and you finally hear him, it settles everything. It works. God does have the right answer. And almost makes you want to sing. And so the prophet Habakkuk wrote a song. And I want to read you some of the words of that song I think they're the most significant, practical, encouraging words 
in the Old Testament, if not the whole Bible. I hope you have it marked. Please highlight it, put stars beside it so you can always find it quickly. Chapter 3, verse 17. We'll begin there. Fig trees may no longer bloom. He's talking about, this is what I think is going to happen. The fig trees won't bloom. Now that's not a good thing if you're a fig farmer or if you like to eat figs and so forth. The fig trees will no longer bloom or vineyards produce grapes. That's what I see, says the prophet. Olive trees may be fruitless and harvest time a failure. Now that's all the agriculture of the land. But then he goes on. Sheep pens may be empty and cattle stalls vacant. The prophet is saying, I can see the very, very, very worst that can happen. I see it. These trees that have figs aren't going to have them anymore. And the vineyards shot, olive trees gone, harvest time, a failure, sheep pens. We don't have sheep reproducing sheep and cattle stalls are empty. It's bad news. But verse 18, circle the first word, but. In the scriptures, you find that the word but comes up at the most wonderful places from time to time. Here's the bad news, 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 but it's not the whole story. You may be going through or will go through some horrible times. It can happen. I was on the edge of not being able to teach this class. Just a few nights before coming here, I was on the edge of going to the hospital. It, it was bad. I couldn't breathe had bronchitis and a lot of other things. And when you can't breathe, you can't sleep, you can't anything. You just think, I'm going to die. When you can't get a breath of air, it looks bad. But the very next day I went to a doctor for the fourth time, got a totally different prescription. It worked. (laughs) I was well in 24 hours. It had been gone on for over two months, 24 hours. Bad, 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 bad. But God turned it around in 24 hours. Verse 18, the prophet says, in spite of all the bad stuff, but I will still celebrate because the Lord God saves me. Circumstances don't look too good, but the Lord God looks good and He will save me. Verse 19, the Lord gives me strength. Before I went to the hospital one night, I knew the next day I was having surgery on my heart. My wife said to me, how are we going to pay the bill? I said, honey, we're doing God's will. It's his bill. And I'm not being arrogant. I just believed he would take care of it. So I went to the hospital. I was there 24, 30 hours. Two weeks later, I got the bill. Over $40,000. No insurance. What are we going to do? I said, we're just, we're just going to trust God. This is not a big deal. <laughs> it looks big. It feels big. It's not a big deal. That's not a big deal for God. Amen? It's not. Not really. They that come to God, Hebrews 6. No, Hebrews 11, verse 6. They that come to God must believe that he is and that he rewards those who serve him, who seek him. Hebrews 11.6. So here's what happened. I got a phone call from the hospital. And the lady said, "Uh, Steve Swihart, we've looked at your bill. And we've decided to write the whole thing off. Every penny. 
You don't owe us a dime. I'll send you the receipt. <laughs> uh, I hope you've heard me tell this before because it's so wonderful to hear that story again. My wife and I don't dance and we don't shout. We're pretty tame. But we did that day. <laughs> you should have heard us and seen us dancing in the living room and shouting because God was good. Bad, 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 bad. But God comes through. I will still celebrate because the Lord God saves me. Verse 19, the Lord gives me strength. He makes my feet as sure as those of a deer. And he helps me stand on the mountains. That's better than the valleys. But God gives you the strength. Don't do it on your own. Trust him. And then what are the last words? To the music director, use stringed instruments when you sing this song and play this music. Some days we cry because we hurt. And some days we cry because we're so blessed. Don't measure your life by circumstances. Measure your life by obedience to God. By getting as close to Papa Daddy as you can get. And I'll tell you that the reward for that is just out of this world. Amen? Amen. We're done.